Hello, I'm Rebecca Lewington and welcome to our podcast. I'm here with nanomanufacturing wizard Christine Thayer from the Advanced Development Technology Group at Micron Utah, where she's responsible for bringing new memory technologies from research and development to high volume manufacturing. Her team's constantly pushing the boundaries of what it's possible to build down at the atomic scale. Also, Christine's just been recognized as a finalist for the 2020 Women Tech Awards, along with a fabulous group of women making an impact in technology. This is very cool. So, Christine, thanks very much for joining me. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Excellent. Well, first, tell us a bit about yourself. What's your role at Micron and what's your background? Um, so currently, I'm part of our dry etch team um, on the Advanced Development Technology Group um, in Micron, Utah. Um, so we focus on um, 3D crosspoint um, technology and kind of bridging that gap between the R&D facility and then our high volume manufacturing facility um, down here in um, Utah. Um, so my background is kind of chemical engineering. Um, I started at Micron Utah back when we were IM Flash um, about nine and a half years ago now um, and have worked in CBD and dry edge during that time and have kind of, you know, moved um, until I got to this point where I deal a lot with new product introduction um, and the process development side more than the manufacturing side. Right, and I am Flash was a joint, joint venture between Intel and Micron at the time for making yeah. flash memory. Right. Yep, yeah, and so then I moved over to Micron. Um, it's been about two and a half years um, that I made the switch to Micron solely. Um, right, yeah. and that's how, the, that's how the fab in Utah became part of the Micron family, I believe. Yeah, that was a, almost a year ago now. Um, okay. The whole fab moved over. There was a group of us that moved a little early based on our job roles. So. Right. So dry etch is a, yep. is a very dry term, sorry, <laughs> for, to describe something that is very a long way from, from wet chemical engineering and is extremely mm -hmm. complicated, but also absolutely fundamental to the chip making process. Could you tell us a bit about what dry etch is? So to make all the chips, you know, you have to make a bunch of different features, you know, on a wafer. And it's really the dry edge process that's responsible for building all of those. You know, you, it's a little bit easier. And I can say that from my CBD days to just put down a blanket foam <laughs> um, of material. But then the dry edge comes in and we use plasmas, um, various chemistries, gases, RF powers to then remove material in some locations and leave it in others to form you know all the different structures that are needed to go into actually building out um, the chips. So the pattern is formed at a prior step? Yeah photo lays down the photoing photo patterning lays down the pattern for us and then we selectively or sometimes not so selectively <laughs> etch um, out the pattern that's been laid down. Right, it's a bit like bit like developing an old time photograph, mm -hmm. except in this case you're trying to make tiny little trenches deep into silicon and silicon nitrides and all kinds of other materials on the wafer. Yep. Yeah. So, bringing new technology from R and D from the lab to high volume manufacturing isn't something that happens overnight. Um, and, and your role is very much to straddle both those worlds. Could you give us a feel for what's involved? Um, so we work with the R&D facility in Boise um, a lot um, and the goal is to kind of get engaged as early as we can um, with them, you know, kind of once they have, you know, a pilot line up and running in the many, in the R&D facility, um, then we kind of start getting engaged and learning and feeding back, hey, this works for manufacturing, you know, this doesn't. Um, as well as learning the process so that we can then bring it to the high volume manufacturing facility and get that all set up. So it's, you know, months of engagement um, to get anything, you know, going and set up before then we start running um, in the high volume manufacturing environment. And then we I take it to, you know, some maturity and qualification so that that's when that part actually, you know, starts making it out to customers. Right, because in the pilot line, they just have to make it work once. Yeah. Right? Whereas there are thousands of devices on a wafer and it, mm -hmm. there are thousands of steps to make a finished chip and you have, your job is to make them work 
nearly all the time. All, all the time. So <laughs> yeah. no pressure. No. <laughs> Which yeah. brings me to this nomination for this award, because mm -hmm. I gather from talking to your peers, it's not unconnected with the work you've been doing successfully taking this stuff from lab to fab. Can you tell us what the award's all about and why it's significant to you? Um, so the Women's Tech Council um, is based here in Utah. Um, so they're a group that was founded, um, you know, to highlight the contributions that women are having, you know, to the tech environment um, here. So um, we've, um, as I am Flash, we've gone to the awards in previous years. Um, and this was the first time um, anyone from our site um, was nominated and then made it into the finalist list. Uh, list. Um, so it's a great honor, um, not only to just have been nominated, you know, by some of my management team for the award in the first place, but then um, to end up on that finalist list with a bunch of other great women who are really, you know, helping drive um, that impact and innovation in the technology um, community here. Right, great. Yeah, I've been talking to some of your peers and they use words like fantastic and amazing when they talk about you. Sorry to be a little my embarrassed you felt this call. But I gather that this the first the, the, the last technology transfer you've just done was done entirely during the pandemic. Yes. So how did you manage to do a technology <laughs> transfer while working remotely? It, it, it's been different um, than anyone that I've ever been a part of. Um, it's still ongoing. I mean, usually we travel. So, you know, normally I'm at the Boise site and, you know, able to interact in person. Instead, it's been a lot of Zoom meetings, um, you know, a lot of emails back and forth. And, um, we've made it work, um, you know, so that um, we're still, you know, making our timelines today um, that we need to be. But um, it has been a little bit more challenging, you know, trying to keep everyone aligned and organized when we're not all actually together. Um, so we've created some new documents, new checklists, um, things to make sure that we're staying on track while also all adjusting to the work from home environment. So when did you last put on a bunny suit? Oh, geez, it's been a really, really long time even before I moved to work from home. I don't remember the last time I went in the fam. Oh, OK. So you, you have <laughs> other people who have to do that stuff for you now. You just yeah, puppet, yeah. Ma puppet master behind the scenes. Pretty much. Um, yeah, most of our team doesn't really go in the fab very much anymore. We have a couple of dedicated um, equipment people on our team, and they're the ones who are in there much more than any of us. Now, I'm not why? sure they like it when we go in. Mess around. With <laughs> get away from my, get away from my, my tools. Don't touch them. How, how is that possible? Is it because the tools have become um, more automated with more sensors, generating more data, so you can really see what's going on without without going into the clean room? Yeah, everything is automated. Like, I can log in to the tools from my desk. I can log into it from my house here. So that's how I'm still able, you know, to set up everything I need. All the data collection gets pushed, you know, to multiple servers. And then we have programs, you know, that we can use to pull that and analyze it. So there really, you know, isn't necessarily a need for us to physically be at the tools um, in most cases. In some cases, when you're trying to do certain investigations, it is definitely helpful if you can go in and see what's actually going on. Um, but for a lot of my job role right now, everything's automated. Um, so I don't need to go in the fab very often. You're as much data scientist as you are engineer now. Yeah, I think most of us are. <laughs> and for those who don't know, when we say tool, in, we're not talking about a, a wrench here. In semiconductor <laughs> terms, this is a big, complicated machine, sometimes as big as a bus that yeah. um, is, is used for make some of the steps, well, all kinds of different machines, all kinds of different steps that make up the chip making process. Now, you etch is just one of the steps. You mentioned earlier there's chemical vapor deposition and physical vapor deposition and atomic lead deposition and cleaning and metrology and and um, yep. and lithography and a whole bunch of other steps I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting. <laughs> Are there similar teams working on those parts of the process or do you take a more holistic view? Yeah, we there's different teams for each of the major um, process areas that you just um, went through. Um, so each one of them has someone who kind of champions, you know, the transfer of the technology and everything. And then 
all of us who are kind of the champions for our areas, you know, then work together to bring in that more holistic view of, hey, to make this work as a part overall, you know, this is what how we all need to work together and get this done, you know, to meet our timelines and all of that. Right. So. It really is an amazing team effort. Yeah, it is. So switching gears a bit, you co-founded the Micron Utah Women's Employee Resource Group, and mm -hmm. you also serve on Micron's technical leadership program, mentoring committee, and given all the other things on your plate, like technology transfers, why is it important for you to find time to do these things? It's important for me to find ways um, to give back um, to, you know, other engineers on site, you know, some of the, um, some of what I, you know, the experiences that I've had and how that's benefited me to make sure that others have access to that, you know, especially on the mentoring side. Um, I was very fortunate um, through my career that I had a couple of mentors just develop naturally. And I'm sure if you ask some of them, if they were ever my mentor, they might laugh and say, no, we just work together. But to me, they were, you know, but for some people, you know, that never happens um, where they develop that, those kind of relationships. And so they need the structure of, you know, the formal mentoring program that we have so that they can, you know, help build out their network, make those connections that can help, you know, lead to different career opportunities because without some of those connections that I had, you know, that's how I kind of got into transfer in the first place was it was a manager at the time and um, another coworker who were like, oh, you should go do this, you know, when it maybe not, might not have been something I had, that would have thought of then, you know, of starting to do. Right. Um, and kind of similar on the women's ERG front, you know, being a woman in, woman in engineering, you know, is still um, a minority. Um, and I've been lucky that I've never, you know, had that negatively impact anything, but, you know, forming that network and environment where, you know, we can talk openly about it and what those struggles are and help provide that support back um is very important to me so i think that's both i mean it's there aren't still aren't enough women in our fields but it is yeah. encouraging to know that you personally have, have not experienced any negative re negative consequences of being born a woman so that's fantastic yeah so what's next for you christine um trying to figure out where i go um with my career now um uh, so I've been doing the technology transfer stuff for about five, six years now, um, which I love doing it. Um, not sure I want to be doing it for five more years, <laughs> but trying to figure out, um, you know, kind of what that next career step is, whether I, you know, look at moving into management or stay on kind of, you know, a more technical path um, with technology transfer and process development side. So first yeah, is getting through the current transfer and then we'll <laughs> and you can take danger or breath but it is good yeah. i think the micron has the technical the, the technical career path that you can mm -hmm. you can take make that choice you don't have to become a manager to move up in the organization right yeah and with exactly. with what the work um, 37 000 team members i think now mm -hmm. and 18 000 of which roughly are in manufacturing and uh, and half of which hold advanced degrees there are quite a few paths you could take within Micron yep. and, still, and still find something interesting to do. Yeah, exactly. And that's just trying to figure out what's out there and what, you know, kind of makes the most sense for me and where I want to go with my career. So right. and we're back to mentoring and networks and all of those yeah. things. Yeah. So Christine, thank you so much for this. It's been absolutely fascinating. I wish you the very best with whatever it is you choose to do next. And um, again, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great to talk with you.